Welcome to a war game review from theplayersaid.com. I'm Grant. Today I uh, am talking about my experiences and thoughts on the very cool, and maybe I'm doing, maybe I'm spoiling it there, but the very cool, deeply thematic, solitaire only war game, The Wars of Marcus Aurelius from Hollenspiel. So I, I have enjoyed this game a lot. I've played it. I think 11 or 12 times. I think it's 11 times. Uh, my record's not great. I'm only 3 and 8. But I have won 3 out of the last 4. And I've I've at least figured out the basics uh, uh, that, that are the best way to go about trying to defeat the game. There still is some luck and some card draws. And frankly, if you just keep drawing the wrong cards over and over and over again and don't get the cards that you need... It can be very challenging. Also, this game is relying on dice rolls. You can mitigate those dice rolls with cards, but there's a, a little bit of randomness there with the dice, and uh, you know everything hinges on those rolls. And if you don't get them, you lose, and you don't push the the barbarians back, and it it just is bad for everybody. But I've never not had a good time playing this game. I've enjoyed each and every play that I've played. I've had a good time. I speak very highly of this game. Robert Dulesky has done a fantastic job of not only incorporating solid gameplay with the way it's set up and the rules being very, very, not simple, but simplified so that they're easy to understand, but he has also integrated a lot of historical elements into the game, not only historical, but thematic. And I'll go through a couple of the cards that I think are really cool that help set the theme for the game. But basically, if you don't know anything about this game, it is 170 to 180 CE. Marcus Aurelius is the leader of the Roman Empire. He is the emperor. He is a warrior emperor. He goes out with his troops, and he's trying to put down the barbarian tribes in the north before they are able to sack Rome and destroy the civilization that he has helped to complete. The game plays out on this very uh, cool map. The map is this playing area. The rest are, are boxes where you put different cards. You keep your forces. You track your Imperium points. You have the turn track and the round track. This is where all the action takes place. And this area is in northern northeastern Europe. This is the Danube River as it comes through this area. And these tribes... The Marcomanni, the Quadi, and the Iazages are revolting against Rome <clears throat> and trying to invade Rome. And we know eventually barbarians sacked Rome. But Marcus Aurelius is doing his best to lead his legions, his very limited legions, against these barbarians and cause them to surrender, take an oath that they won't fight back, and that they will be peaceful. The game has this map which has three tracks, the Marcomani track, the Quadi track, and the Iazages track. These tracks are where these barbarian counters live. Uh, sorry, I've got the wrong one. And they will, those counters will play off of barbarian cards, which call, is called the barbarian deck, and they will take actions based on what those cards say. They will advance, uh, they will become bold, they will become demoralized, uh, and then the Romans have to fight them back. The Romans also have to fight off all types of events from the plague to off-map conflicts. You can read those spaces here, which are revolts or other invasions from the other parts of the empire. They also have to deal with internal strife, mutinies, uh, men not wanting to fight for, uh, for Caesar and for Rome. They, they, they're tired of fighting. So there's all kinds of troubles that are having to be fought through. And uh, the game actually works really well. It is a pseudo card driven system. And what I mean by that is, I'll show you a couple of examples of, of Roman cards. These are examples of Roman cards. So I'll show you the first one here. You'll notice this just said at, says action card. Roman turn, discard this card to take one action. So a player, when they draw this card, they can discard it to the discard pile, and they can take one of, I believe, five, uh, five actions. Let me go ahead and 
and walk you through uh, those actions, you are able to, sorry, you're able to discard a card to attack one of the barbarian armies. You can discard a card to place a couple of level one forts. And these are counters that represent forts that you're building on the frontier. Level one is the this side, which only gives a plus one attack. Level two is where it gives a plus two attack, but also gives what's called a pacification value. So you can place two of those forts out. You can turn one level one fort over into a level two fort. You can also discard a card to bump up your Imperium points. Imperium points are in essence the amount of support that you have back home from the Roman citizenry, the Senate, as well as your men. Do they want to fight for you? Do they support what you are doing? If you lose too much, if you lose in the wrong way and are demoralized, you will lose these Imperium points and people will start to lose faith. So that's why I call these you know, pseudo, uh, uh, pseudo card driven because you can discard a card and then there are cards like this that have actions printed on them. You can see this one says divide and conquer after the barbarian card draw, select one barbarian card activation from the most recent draw and move a different tribe instead. So they may have said move the Marcomani, but you didn't want them to move because you had them in their homeland you can then play that card and move another tribe instead. So those are examples of events. Here's another example of event. Roman dur turn during the winter round. Make up to two attacks during one winter round. Do not suffer negative one. So you can play that. You have to discard a card to do that attack, but this says that you can make up to two attacks during one winter round. Um, so there are all different types of cards like that. So that's why it's called a pseudo card driven because it has the discard the card or events, but it doesn't have what typically are referred to as op points, a value on the top of the card that you can use to take a certain amount of actions. So they kind of forewent that and then just did this discard a card to take an action, which I think works really, really well. So each round here on the map, you can see during the spring round, the Romans are going to draw five cards, so they will get five cards from their Roman deck. And then the Barbarians always will draw three cards. So here I'll give you an example. You draw these cards and then you play these cards out one at a time. This one says activate the Quadi uh, tribe and move them forward. Or if they are demoralized, you flip them to bold. This card is of the same thing. It says flip the Marcomani to bold and perform an Oathbreaker check. So these are bad things that are going to happen. Advance the Eazages forward one space. So in the Barbarian deck, you're going to have cards that move those Barbarians down. If those Barbarians get into these different boxes, you can see this one said the raid, says the raid into Moesia box, the raid into Pannonia box, and then this one is the Rome box. If the Marcomanni ever enter this Rome box, the game is immediately over. So you can auto-lose that way. If the Quadi enter the Raid into Pannonia box, you're simply going to lose one of these Imperium points. If your Imperium point track ever gets to zero or usurped, you lose the game immediately. People don't support you anymore and they kick you out. The Raid into a Moesio box, if the Eazages get into there, you're going to discard a card. If you can't, then you're going to lose an IP. So you're going to fight these tribes. You're going to push them back, trying to get them into their home territories, and then defeat them in combat, they will then become a surrendered tribe. And they will move down to the surrendered tribe box, and then they are out of the game and cannot do anything until an Oathbreaker card is pulled. If an Oathbreaker card is pulled, like I just showed you, this one that says Balamar, this is an Oathbreaker check. It's going to force what's called an Oathbreaker check on that, on that barbarian tribe. They have to roll a d6, and they must roll higher than the pacification value for the Romans on that track. The pacification value comes from a couple of different things. The number of legions in the box, you can see this has three legions in the box, so that's going to be 
3 to that total pacification value. You add the combat value of any leader in that box. Here you can see Maximanus has 2. So right now that pacification value is a 5. If the Oathbreaker check is caused, the Markamani would have to roll a 6 or higher, and there are no higher rolls to become an Oathbreaker and then be put back in their home territory, activated again, and back in the fight. You then also add to that value the level of number, the level of second level forts that you have, the number of second level forts that you have. Remember, I showed you that counter, and it has not only an attack value, but a pacify value. So I have only one second level fort on this track. That would only add plus one to the pacification value. So that would make this pacification value a six. So the chance that they cannot roll higher than a six, therefore they are pacified and cannot enter the game. So that's the other thing that's very cool about this game. You're not only trying to defeat these barbarians all, you win by defeating all three of them at the same time, meaning all three are surrendered, but you have to manage your scarce resources, your legions and your leaders, in these boxes to try and keep these pacified. And at the start of the game, you only have two leaders. One is a very low-level leader. The other is Marcus Aurelius. And you only have 10 legions to spread amongst these three boxes. So you have to be really good and force, you know, focus on one, putting, say, Marcus Aurelius with six legions until they're defeated. Then you have to build a series of forts. Then you have to leave some guys behind to make those pacification rolls more and more difficult. I really like that element of the game, that management of your scarce resources. Now, there are a couple of legions that you can bring into the game, as well as a, a more powerful leader, uh, Mark Maximanius, which I showed you. Um, those come through cards being played, cards in the Roman deck. But it's one of those things. You're going to have to sacrifice that card and play that event to do that, to get an extra resource. So it's a matter of managing those scarce resources, using them properly to make sure that you have the appropriate number of forces to not only maintain pacification, but to continue an offensive barrage against, against the barbarians. So let's talk about combat a little bit, because there's some really cool things about combat. Combat is very simple. So let me move the quad eye uh, counter down here to this box the, that only gives them a plus two. Their total attack value at this point is a seven. Five for the quad eye combat value and plus two for the terrain value. The terrain value is very cool. I think it's very thematic. It shows that the barbarians are familiar with their own home territory. They're familiar with the mountains, the hills, the forest, the rivers where they can and cannot cross, where forage uh, is easily found, areas that are easily defended, and they are able to take advantage of that. When they get closer and closer to their home territory, you'll notice those terrain values really increase. They go from plus two to plus four, plus four to plus seven, and then plus seven to plus eight in the quad eye home, uh, homeland. So you can see when the quad eye are at home, they're a total of a 13. That's going to be really hard to beat because they have a 13 base and then they roll a six and add to that. So reality, in reality, they can have a 19 combat value. So it's very hard to overcome. The Romans, they take the number of legions in their stack and they can have a maximum of six legions in any one of these army boxes. They then, then add the combat value of their leader. In this instance, Marcus Aurelius adds plus three. Sorry, it's kind of dark, uh, but you can see that, that he adds plus three to that combat value. So their base value is a nine. You can then add the value of any forts in those areas that you are fighting them. So for instance, in this home quad eye territory, I have a level two fort, so I'm gonna add plus two to that attack. So you can see in that home territory, the Romans are going to be an 11 versus a 13. So you ask yourself, well, how are they going to win that? Well, you roll two dice. I've got a red dice and a green dice. The red is obviously the Romans. The green is the barbarians. We're going to roll those. And uh-oh, that's not good. So in this instance, the barbarians win 
all that's going to happen is the Romans are going to lose one of their legions. They're going to put it into the recovery box because they need to be refitted, resupplied, and reinforced. And now his attack value for the next attack, if he wants to push one, is now only an eight versus a nine. Now flip those rolls. Let's say I had a five and the barbarians had a one. I would defeat the barbarians because I was a nine and five is 14, 15, 16 for the fort. And the barbarians are a 13 plus one, 14. So I would have won that. If you defeat them in the home territory, you're going to put them in the surrendered box. If you defeat them in any of these other spaces, you're simply going to push them one space closer to, the, closer to their homeland. So that's the way combat works. Now, combat, in order to do well at combat, a player is going to be forced to have to kind of stack good cards, offensive cards, to make their attacks really count. And let me find a couple here for you. Um... But, but that's also another very cool element. You know, you're forcing the barbarian or the, the Roman player to decide how they use their cards. A lot of times they're going to use their cards to make sure their attacks count. And then you have to really figure out how to get a couple of these cards that give big bonuses because sometimes those barbarians are really hard to defeat. So here's an example of two cards I want to show you. This one's called Ambush. This is a battle before dice roll play. So I'm going to add three to the Roman battle roll. If I win, I'm going to flip the barbarian army to its demoralized side and retreat at one space. This can be used in off-map map conflicts. So that's these. We'll talk about that here in a moment. If you look at the barbarian counters, here's their normal side. It's a five. If they are demoralized, they are flipped and they are only a three. So that's part of, uh, you want to make sure you can get them demoralized because they're going to be lesser value. In this home space, if he's demoralized, he's only on 11. That's a little easier to overcome. But back to this card. This card's going to add three to your roll. So you're going to roll your dice. Ooh, I rolled a six plus three for this card. All of a sudden, ooh, I'm plus nine and I'm going to win that combat. The next card that I'm showing you here is before the dice roll, I'm going to discard this card to reduce the terrain value by half in one battle. So that remember that terrain value in this battle is plus eight. So I'm going to reduce that to only a plus four. All of a sudden, the quad eye goes from an, a 13 if he's not demoralized. If he's demoralized and I'm able to reduce that with this local guides card, all of a sudden he's only a seven. That's a lot easier to defeat. Now, I really like the historical element of this card or these types of cards. For instance, ambush. You know, the Romans were good stat tact tacticians. They were going to look for any opportunity to ambush or use subterfuge to defeat their enemies. So I really like that. Th this kind of a card exists in the deck. The local guides demonstrates that the Romans were powerful and could bribe people to betray their own people. So to me, this card, local guides where the terrain value is lessened, somebody from the Quadi kingdom betrayed them to the Romans for silver and basically said, hey, they're going to attack you tomorrow from here. That allowed the Romans to get into position to nullify that advantage. So I really feel like the, the designer did a great job of making these cards very thematic to understand some of the history and some of the tactics uh, used by, by the Romans. So that's a look at battle. Now, the other thing I want to talk about here very quickly are these off-map conflict cards. So once again, the main focus of the game is this northeastern frontier and the barbarian invasions. But occasionally in the barbarian deck, a card like this comes up. This card is a, uh, it's called an off-map conflict card, the Kostobachi. So basically, this is an internal conflict in the Eastern Roman Empire that the player has to deal with. You'll notice the card has a 5 value. That means its combat value is a 5. When you attack this card, you're going to have to roll a d6 like normal and add your total bonus. You're gonna, it's going to add its bonus of their rolled dice to this total, and you're going to have to overcome that to defeat this card. 
So this card is going to be placed, it says, in the Eastern Empire. And only one card of any type can be in either one of those sides. And there's four or five of these cards total. So this Kostabachi will be put in the Eastern Empire. It will sit there until you do a couple of things. You've got to move a group of soldiers with a leader up to this box. Guess what? That's going to cost you discarding two cards. So from your hand, you're going to have to discard two cards, which is a lot, to move these guys up here. Then it says round one, discard to maintain the army. So if you go from one round to the next, you're going to have to discard another card to keep that army up there in, their, in that area fighting. That can be very expensive. You're also going to have to discard another card for that army to beat, to try to attack and defeat uh, this, this off-map conflict. So at this point, there's a four. I'm a five on its five. We're going to roll off, and, and we're going to see who wins. Up. Oh. So the at this point, the Kostobachi have won. Now, if I have a card in my hand... I can discard one other card just one time to give myself plus one in, in battle. So all of a sudden, oh, we're tied. What happens when you tie? You just roll again and use all the same bonuses. Okay, so this time, the Romans are going to defeat the Costabachi, put down that rebellion, and this card will now be put into what's called the history pile. The history pile is an after end game scoring mechanism that just gives you extra points. So you don't really need to worry about that until we get to that final, final part. Then this off-map conflict is done. If I don't want to keep these guys here at the end of the round, I, I can just redistribute them down here, or I can keep them up there and I can pay a card to keep them in that area. But I'm going to tell you that gets very expensive, and you don't necessarily have the resources to do that. Here's another example of one of those off-map conflict cards. You can see this one's less powerful. It's a four, and it will go in the Western Roman Empire, but you have to deal with that again. Now, what happens if you don't deal with that at, by the end of the year? If you don't deal that with that by the end of the year, you're going to lose an Imperium point for each card in these boxes. And once again, your Imperium points, if they ever get to zero, you lose the game automatically. So that is not something that you want to do. I also really like this element because I think it's very cool that they took into effect or into account other historical events. <clears throat> Not just the Barbarian Wars, but other things that would have happened in the Empire that took the focus away from the main battles and forced Marcus Aurelius, the Senate, the Empire, the Emperor to deal with those issues. So a very, another very, very cool element of this game. Another thing that happens in the Barbarian deck, so remember you draw three Barbarian cards every round and you're going to play those one at a time. Some of these cards, and I'll show you this one, say at the end, add this card to the Surge Pile. The Surge Pile is represented on the map by these three boxes. So when you have to play one card to the Surge Pile, nothing happens. The next time you play another card that says add to the Surge Pile, two cards are going to go in there and nothing happens. Now, when the third card gets played and goes into there, you create a surge. What a surge is, whatever this card activated, so let's assume this card activated the Marcomani and caused them to move. What's gonna happen now is a surge goes off, you take all three of these cards, put them in the discard, the discard pile. It's gonna activate the other two barbarian cards or tribes that have not been activated. So you would have the Quadi activate. In this instance, the Quadi are demoralized. They're going to now become bold. So they're going to flip their counter over, and they're going to become their most powerful level. The Eazages, they're at their most powerful level. They're simply going to move, uh, move up on the track. So that's what a surge is. The good news about surges is if you have a card in your hand left over from the, at the end of the round, you can discard that card to prevent a surge. Now the cards then disappear, but the surge doesn't happen. And that's a very valuable thing. Um, trying to make sure those surges don't happen is something that you've got to plan for. So I also like that element of the game. 
because those barbarian tribes really work off of each other. If they're doing well, if they're doing poorly, sometimes they help each other in the game historically and thematically. So in the end, what's going to happen is you're going to fight this game until eventually you have all three tribes in the surrendered box. Then you're going to go to the to the scoring round. And you're going to and you actually score if you win and if you lose. And to score when you win, here, I'm going to go ahead and open up the rules and just look at that. It's it's actually very simple. What you're going to do is you're first going to count the number of years left on your track. So let's assume I won in 174 CE, which earlier today I played, did a playthrough, and I won in 174 CE. So I'm going to count one, two, three, four, five. You count the end box as well. That's six. So my so I have a six. Then you're going to add to that score one point for any card barbarian card in the history pile. I, if, you, if you remember the example, I defeated this Costabachi. That's going to give me one extra point, so I'm now at a 7. Then I add my current IP value. I think I had a 3. 7 plus 3 is 10. Then I'm simply going to divide that number by 2, rounding up. So 10 divided by 2 is 5. My final score is a 5. So your final score basically is a, a number that, that uh, is out of 10. So I scored a 5 out of 10. I did average, right? I did okay. My highest score, I got a 7 out of 10 one time when I won. So you can see there's a scoring mechanism that you can kind of say, oh, I had a decent victory or, boy, I just barely won or I didn't, didn't score very well even though I almost won. So kind of an interesting element. I don't know that that absolutely is absolutely is necessary, but it, it, it is included in the game. One other element I wanted to talk to you before I go into my final thoughts. In the rule book, and I'll show you this, they have a supplemental section that gives you notes on all of the barbarian cards and all of the Roman cards that he used in the, the design. So it literally goes down and it talks about those different events. So remember the Costabachi card that I talked about. I'll read this to you. Tribal raiders plundered their way deep into the Balkans and Greece, reaching as far as Eleusius near Athens, where they burned the temple of the Eleusinian Mysteries. So once again, that was a historical event that Robert Dulesky used to represent one of these off-conflict, off-map conflicts. So all of these cards that are involved in this game are very, very cool. There's some cinematic elements if you remember the movie Gladiator, which covers this period in time, there is this card, Maximus Decimus Meridius. You can literally use Maximus as a leader instead of Marcus in a combat. He's going to add plus four to your value, and you and you roll, and he leads the battle, and it, it becomes very cin cinematic. I've won the game with that card before. So I really enjoy that element, and I appreciate that being included in the game, and frankly, really, really enjoy that. So thank you, Robert, for including that. So my final thoughts on this game. Man, this game is hard. I, I'm not going to lie to you. It uh, My record is 3-8. and eight. Um, And that's okay, because I feel like I have learned. I lost, I think, my first six games, and then I've won three out of my... Uh, I lost, lost my first seven games, and I won three out of my last four. So I figured the game out a little bit, but it's still a challenge. There are still times where you're not going to roll the dice you need. You're not going to draw the cards you need. You may have a bad card come against you that just didn't, didn't help you at all, and that sometimes is what happens. Um, but I love this game. I love everything you have to focus on. You have to focus on the different... You have to focus on beating back all three of these tribes... Once you beat him, you have to focus on pacifying him. You have to juggle your resources. Very well done. You also have to worry about this Imperium track. I never like to get my Imperium track below three. There are three or four events in the deck that will um, automatically make you lose one or two points, and that can cause an auto loss. Also, one thing I didn't talk about with you is if, if you roll a six... With an army in combat led by Marcus Aurelius, you get an Imperium point. Yay! But if you roll a one, you lose an Imperium point. And I'm going to tell you, 
at the worst times, you're going to end up rolling a one and you're going to lose an Imperium point and it's going to put you on the verge of defeat. The other thing that's cool is the Barbarians, if they roll a six, they become boldened. So if they are demoralized, meaning if their counter was flipped to their less side, if they roll a six, they're going to go to their five side, their better side, their five or four side. Conversely, if they roll a one, they're going to get demoralized. So there are some elements like that that I think, you know, if battles go poorly, soldiers didn't like that. They started to lose faith not only in their commander, but in themselves and their fighting ability. They also would get worried or scared about their enemies, and it would cause them to become demoralized. So I think they really captured that very well. I also really like the difficult choices that you have in this game. There are a lot of options. You can discard for forts. You can discard... Uh, to get Imperium points. You can play certain cards to bring in reinforcements or better leaders or to move and take care of off-map conflicts. You can attack, you can attack, and you can attack some more. But I like the choices that you have to make. Do I go ahead and attack on the quad eye, even though I probably have a one in three chance of winning, but if I can win this battle, I'm going to defeat him. Man, that's a great choice. And there are times that I say, heck, forget it. I'm going to roll and, and sometimes I win, sometimes I lose. But I like that. You have to be aggressive in this game. I like that. If you're not aggressive, if you're, if you're passive, you know, you're, you're, you're going to kind of drag it out and you're going to get down near the end and then you're going to have to do some heroic, amazing things to win. I also love that you have to manage your cards well. I like to carry over at least one card, sometimes two in my hand, for a couple of purposes. One, so that I have a card I can discard to stop a surge from happening. Or I'm stacking good events so that my combat rolls can be better. Sometimes having a local guides card and a, a, an ambush card and holding them for one or two rounds until you get the right opportunity is very, very important because you can really win with a combination of those two cards. So I really like that. So what did I not like about the game? Well, I think there is a steep learning curve. I think the first four or five games, I lost by usurpation four or five times, honestly. This got to zero, and I just kept telling myself, what am I going to do to stop that? Well, what you have to do is you have to, you have to have some certain rules. You have to take any of the cards that give you plus two IP. I don't care what's going on. you got to take those because those two IP are very, very, very valuable. Remember, discarding one card only gets you one. So if I have a card that can give me two, I'm going to go ahead and use that nine times out of ten. The other thing I had to learn, the lesson I had to learn, is putting forts down. You'll notice almost every spot has a fort on my different tracks. That's expensive. When you discard a card, you get two level one forts. You discard another card, you can increase one level one fort to level two. So you can see I spent a lot of resources and a lot of time getting these built up. Because they not only aid in combat, but they also aid in you pacifying and keeping those surrendered tribes surrendered. So very, very important. Um, so that learning curve, very, very, very steep. I also, I, th I think the board is amazing. I would have liked to have seen it be a little bigger. I, I think when I play this sometimes, I, I get confused by the different colors. And there's this huge area over here for all of these cards. I think they could have shrunk that a little bit. But I'm going to tell you, the counters are amazing. They're very well done. They're very, very thick. I'm a counter clipper, and I didn't clip these cards be, or these counters because they don't need it. The cards are fantastic. Historically, they're very well done. They're beautiful. You know, those backs have relief uh, from, from Roman art on them. I think the rule book is very well done. It's organized well. It's easy to follow. And I think the language in it used is very appropriate. I love it also that it's a solitaire game that is challenging. If you're looking for a good challenge, this game is going to do that. So I look forward. I've actually tried, I've been trying to get a couple of copies of Hollenspiel's other solitaire games. NATO Air Commander we have, but I would love to get Agricola and the other game Charlemagne because they're very similar games, different, but they are solo games that are very, very, very challenging. I also do know that I believe Robert Dulesky is working on a follow-up to this game, and I can't wait for that to come out because I really enjoyed this game. 
So I sorry I hit the camera. So my final concluding thought is if you like solitaire gaming, get this game. It's very it's a very good value. It's going to cost you $45 off of their website. But I've played this 11 times. I'm going to keep it in my collection because this is one of those games I'm going to pull off the shelf every now and then just to play because I think it's fun. You can play a game in 40 to 45 minutes and it's going to be very fulfilling and very fun. So I think it's a great value. I think it's a well done and well made game. And I think that uh, it, it actually is very historically themed and accurate and I really, really like that. So those are my thoughts, guys, on the Wars of Marcus Aurelius, Rome, 170 to 180 CE from Hollenspiel. I would, I would encourage you to go ahead and get a copy of this because I think it's really great, a great game. So thanks for watching. I also, if you wanted to know, I did shoot a playthrough video. It took about an hour and six minutes, uh, but that will be up on the blog. Either we posted it before this review or shortly after, so you can watch that as well. Also, if you're interested, I did write five of my patented action points where I went through different elements of the game, talked about the barbarian tracks, the different decks, talked about different things like the off-map conflicts, the Imperium track. I gave a strategy guide. We went through an example of combat. So I think those will give you a good feel in written form for how the game plays and what the rules are. So have fun with that uh, with those as well. So thank you for watching. I've been Grant from The Player's Aid. Check out our blog at theplayersaid.com. You can also check out our YouTube uh, channel, The Player's Aid. Uh, we love to do what we do and are having a great time. So please let us know what your thoughts are. And uh, I really appreciate you guys watching. Thank you.